world looks good, Gus. You land at a new position in San Antonio. You have great colleagues. The chair assured you that you could continue your pain research started in Philadelphia. And today is your first day at the rheumatology clinic. What is that head nurse's name? Kathy? No, Cindy. Yeah, Cindy. They told me to ask for Cindy and she would orient me to the clinic. Looks like it's going to be a busy day. Good morning, doctor. How may I help you? Is Cindy around? I'm Dr. Tori. Yes, just a moment and I'll get her for you. My name is Joe Richards. I have an appointment with Dr. Tori. Thank you. Please have a seat. Will the doctor be on time? I haven't heard otherwise, Mr. Richards. Well, I have a load of plywood to deliver to McAllen, and I would like to get an early start. Yes, may I help you? Sí, por favor. Señora Martínez, qué gusto de verla. Hace tanto tiempo que no nos vemos. ¿Cómo está la familia? Bien, con la excepción de mi esposo. ¿Qué pasa? Pues parece que va a estar sin trabajo. No me diga. Sí, la fábrica la van a cerrar el año que viene. Qué lástima. Sí, pero mañana será otro día. Spanish. Oh, boy, I'm in trouble. How will I be able to administer my research instruments, especially the McGill Pain Questionnaire, to Spanish-speaking patients? ¿Y usted cómo está? Ay, tengo tanto, sigo con el mismo dolor tan fuerte. Me duele tanto. Ojalá que su operación le dé alivio. Con el favor de Dios. Hasta luego. Dios. May I help you? Yeah, my father has an appointment with Dr. Tori in the rheumatology clinic. Do you have his clinic card? Papá, tu tarjeta. Ah, Chihuahua. José tiene mi tarjeta. ¿Quién? El hijo de mi compadre Jorge. Tú sabes, el más chico, al que le nombran flaco. Ah, sí. El que te iba a traer y al último momento te llamó para decirte que no. Qué irresponsable. Pues, hija, uno no sabe su situación. He doesn't have it. Is that a problem? I feel like I'm in a different world. This patient population in San Antonio is so different from the one I worked with in Philadelphia. So many Hispanic patients. Some speak only Spanish, and some speak English and Spanish. Yes, you will have to go to admissions on the first floor and bring me back a card. ¿Qué pasó, hija? Tenemos que ir. ¿Cómo puedo ayudarle? I don't speak Spanish. Oh, boy, now I'm really confused. Mexican-American but doesn't speak Spanish? What's going on here? Who are these people? My mom forgot to tell you that my grandma won't be able to make her appointment today because she was feeling too sick. Does she have another appointment for next week? What is your grandmother's name? Gloria Fernandez. Did she have an appointment with Dr. Tori at the rheumatology clinic? Yes, I think this is his name. It's the new doctor. Would Wednesday at the same time be okay? Yes, my mom said any day. Understanding the culture and language of your patients is a critical first step when attempting a cross-cultural adaptation of research instruments. A true understanding of the culture can only be achieved by acquainting yourself with the reality of your patients' everyday lives, knowing their experiences and the way they deal with them understanding their design for living that defines their unique worldview. The unique characteristics of any culture include the group's responses to five basic questions. How do people in the group relate to one another? How do they relate to time? What is their relationship to nature? What is the key characteristic of their personality? What is their moral predisposition? To better understand this concept, let's compare the responses of Mexican-Americans and Anglo-Americans to these five questions. Please understand that the descriptors we will use to define these two cultures reflect each group of people collectively, and that individual and subgroup differences exist based, among other things, on generational and socioeconomic differences. In each of the examples, language will be used to illustrate the descriptor. The language we speak determines the way we think and feel. 
language defines the world we live in. If we were asked to define Mexican Americans as a people, the term familiistic would be the best descriptor. As a member of this culture, you care about what family the person belongs to. You think about the person as a member of that family. In contrast, Anglo-Americans would best be characterized as individualistic. In this culture, the individual is emphasized almost to the exclusion of the family. The familial identity of the Mexican-American is reflected in the rules of social interaction, where it is polite and expected that you will inquire about the family. Señora Martinez, qué gusto de verla. Hace tanto tiempo que no nos vemos. ¿Cómo está la familia? Time is a basic orientation that all cultural groups define for themselves. This definition characterizes the group as either being oriented in the present, past, or future. Being present oriented is a hallmark of the Mexican American culture, which contrasts to future orientation of the Anglo American. Many expressions exist in the Mexican American language which illustrate this present time orientation. Bien, con la excepción de mi esposo. ¿Qué pasa? Pues parece que va a estar sin trabajo. No me diga. Sí, la fábrica la van a cerrar el año que viene. Qué lástima. Sí. Pero mañana será otro día. The nature question demands a response that uniquely delineates how the people belonging to a specific cultural group will relate to the world around them and to the other elements in the universe. Subjugation best describes the Mexican-American orientation to nature. They see themselves as a part of the natural order. Domination would best characterize the Anglo-American, a culture that seeks to dominate nature, to control natural events, to be masters of the natural world. In contrast, the Mexican-American culture appears to live more in harmony with nature and to acquiesce to forces that appear to be out of their control. Again, language mirrors this subjugation orientation to nature. ¿Y usted cómo está? Ay, sigo con el dolor. Me duele tanto. Ojalá que su operación le dé alivio. Con el favor de Dios. Hasta luego. Dios. The personality question requires a culture to define its members either in terms of being or doing. Being is most closely associated with the Mexican American culture. In the Anglo American culture, doing is the best descriptor. One's occupation becomes the basic definition of an individual, as reflected in the often repeated question. What do you do? In the Mexican-American culture, an individual is defined primarily by relationships and personal qualities. Papa, tu tarjeta. Ah, Chihuahua. José tiene mi tarjeta. ¿Quién? El hijo de mi compadre Jorge. Tú sabes, el más chico, al que le nombran flaco. Predisposition refers to the basic question of how a culture defines human nature in terms of goodness or evil. The Mexican-American culture chooses not to stand in judgment and maintains that every individual is a mixture of good and bad. Influenced by the Calvinistic tradition, Anglo-Americans view man's nature as basically evil. However, it is held that man can be perfected through discipline. The Mexican-American trait of suspending judgment is reflected in this dialogue. Ah, sí. El que te iba a traer y te llamó al último momento para decirte que no. Qué irresponsable. Pues uno no sabe su situación, hija. The descriptors associated with the dimensions of people, time, nature, personality, and predisposition form a composite definition of the traditional Mexican-American and Anglo-American cultures. They describe an ideal type or heuristic device that itself is not real, but serves as a tool that helps us gain insight into these cultures and the differences between them. Due to sustained contact with the broader American society, 
Mexican Americans of any generation may exhibit values more descriptive of the Anglo-American culture. Because of individual and subgroup differences, there exist many variations to the Mexican-American ideal type. Language also reflects the degree to which individuals identify with one or the other culture. Mexican Americans may be monolingual Spanish speakers, bilingual English Spanish speakers, or monolingual English speakers. Language use is dependent upon generational differences and the degree of assimilation to the broader American society. Because your patient is Mexican American, you cannot assume that he or she speaks Spanish. ¿Cómo puedo ayudarle? I don't speak Spanish. Dr. Tori? Yes. Welcome. I'm Cindy Nelson, the head nurse for this clinic. Pleased to meet you. Let me give you a quick tour. Sounds good. Norma, yes. do you have a minute? Sure. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tori. Norma, buddy, you're pleased to meet you. Hi. How are Norma you? is one of the bilingual nurses assigned to rheumatology. She just moved from Mexico City two weeks ago, and she'll be assisting you. Well, great. I may be asking you to help me translate the pain questionnaire I use in my research. That sounds interesting. I'll look forward to working with you. All right. When you're finished with your tour, I have your first patient waiting in room three. Good. So your father has been bothered by head pain all this past week. Yes, doctor. He's been complaining about his headaches all week. Norma, would you ask Mr. Fernandez if he would describe his pain as flickery? Señor Fernandez, el dolor que usted siente, ¿puede describirlo como aleteante? Alenteante, hija, yo no entiendo. ¿Qué quiere decir alenteante? ¿Sí? Ay, papá. My father doesn't understand the word that you use for flickering. In South Texas, we use estremecimiento. What's happening, Norma? There's some vocabulary differences between the Spanish spoken in Mexico and the Spanish spoken in South Texas. I haven't been here long enough to know them all. Well, it looks like translating the McGill questionnaire won't be as straightforward as I thought. What if I asked each of you to describe pain using six different words? How would you translate them? Let's go back to flickering. Aleteante. Estremecimiento. Okay. Quivering. Vibrante. Temblante. All right. Pulsing. Pulsante. The yeah. same word, pulsante. Pulsante. Throbbing. Um, I can't think of an equivalent word. Palpitante would express the concept Palpitante. of throbbing in South Texas. Beating. Palpitante. Golpeante. 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 Pounding. Golpeante. Martillante. All right. Pulsing was the only word that was translated with the same Spanish word. Two of the words on the list had different meanings for both of you. Palpitante meant throbbing to Maria and beating to you. And Maria used the word golpeante as beating, and you used golpeante for the word pounding. And Norma, you didn't have an equivalent for the word throbbing? No, I can't think of a Spanish word that we would use in Mexico to express that concept. What a challenge. How can we translate these words so they have an equivalent meaning for those taking the McGill questionnaire both in English and those taking it in Spanish? Understanding the cultural and linguistic differences of your patient populations is only a first step when attempting to cross cultural adaptation of a research instrument. Establishing equivalency procedures that test for semantic equivalence of words and phrases composes the crucial second step. Presented for your consideration is a translation model that has proven effective in ensuring the semantic or meaning equivalence of new language versions of an assessment tool. It consists essentially of establishing two different types of focus groups or review panels. The first set of review panels focuses on semantic equivalence and the second set of panels establishes preliminary quantitative equivalence. The bilingual professional panel should consist of a cross-section of appropriate professionals and researchers. For health-related questionnaires, 
The panel should include persons such as physicians, research nurses, and sociologists. It is important that these individuals have extensive experience interacting with the target population, as well as an understanding of the lexicon of both languages. The task of this group is to draft a first translation of the instrument. Using the McGill Payne questionnaire as an example, the panel would be requested to provide equivalent Spanish words for all 78 English pain descriptors. If it's pulsing, pulsante, pulsante and would throbbing like a little bit better, and then throbbing, latidos. Latidos. Or latiendo. Latiendo, I don't know. Latiendo? Latiendo, you know, or, you know, latido or latidos. The diversity in the membership of this panel guards against two major weaknesses of translated forms that affect the generalizability of results semantic idiosyncrasy and ambiguity. Having more than one or two translators filters out the individual language variation so that the consensus represents a word that can be understood by a broad spectrum of the target population. Focusing on selecting words that have meaning for the broader population also guards against the inclusion of ambiguous terms. An independent bilingual panel similar to the composition of the first is convened once the instrument has been translated. The task of the members is to back translate the Spanish version into the original source language, in this case, English. Members work only from the Spanish version and must reach consensus on the appropriate English term that is equivalent to the Spanish pain descriptor. I think what my thought on those three words is that um, they both reflect a kind of a intermittent... Uh... The group process of back-translating the instrument reveals unexpected meaning or interpretation in the Spanish version relative to the English. A bilingual focus group of health professionals and consumers, including some from the previous panels, reach consensus on the final Spanish version. I agree. Okay, tugging and uh, tirante, it's okay. Pulling, I agree with him. It's like more like estirar, you know, mm -hmm. stretch it. Mm -hmm. Once the members of the focus group achieve consensus on all of the words in terms of semantic equivalency, the final translated version of the instrument is produced. Determining quantitative equivalency of the Spanish and English words is a necessary second step for such instruments as the McGill Payne questionnaire that rank the respondents' responses in terms of intensity within each dimension category. The task of this panel is to rate the intensity of the Spanish and English words using a 100 millimeter visual analog scale. Panel members complete this task individually. Half of the members of the panel rate the English form first and the Spanish form second. The other half rate the Spanish form first and the English form second. To reduce response bias, the second rating is done on a separate date. The healthcare consumers are approached on an individual basis in the work setting. It is important that the members of this panel approximate the SES level of the target population. Upon completion, the panel's average score for each word is determined. Associations between scores for the Spanish and English words can then be graphed on a scatter plot for both groups. The strength and significance of the associations can be determined by calculating Pearson correlation coefficients. With correlations of 0.85 and 0.80 and no evidence of systematic differences, these plots demonstrate very high agreement between the English and the Spanish intensity ratings for both medical providers and medical consumers. This provides preliminary evidence of quantitative equivalence. So you understand Mr. Richards? I'm going to read you a list of words and I want you to tell me which word on this list best describes the pain that you've been experiencing in your knees this past week. Sure Doc, go ahead, I'm ready. Dull, sore, hurting, aching, heavy, None. Sore. Sore. It took me a while to get up and going, mm -hmm. but I made it to work every day. Even if and I come up with a good Spanish that. translation, how will I know if the Spanish speakers are responding differently from my English-speaking patients? If the culture 
and language are so different, it seems to me that might introduce some systematic bias in responses. Choosing a statistical test to apply to test scores of respondents from different cultural and linguistic backgrounds is a powerful method of determining what psychometricians call differential item functioning. The mantel hansel test provides a relatively simple yet powerful statistical procedure to ascertain whether systematic differences exist between the two language versions. Let's walk through the different steps involved in a differential item functioning study using hypothetical data. The first step is to identify a criterion group and a target group. Given the example we have been using, members of the criterion group would be English speakers, either non-Hispanic white or Mexican-American, and the target group would be Mexican-American Spanish speakers. The McGill Payne questionnaire is then administered to independent random samples drawn from each group. You will need a minimum sample size of 100 for each group. 200 would be comfortable. A frequency distribution is then generated for the total Payne score based on the combined data of these two groups. Matched Payne groups are then created based on the frequency distribution of the overall scores. For example, the lower third would represent individuals whose overall score indicates that they experience relatively low levels of pain. The middle third would represent individuals who experience moderate levels of pain. And the upper third would represent individuals who experience high levels of pain. Members of the target and criterion groups are then matched with respect to the overall level of pain they experience. Now that we have divided the respondents by overall scores, we need to further subdivide groups within the three overall pain categories by high and low pain responses for each individual pain descriptor. For example, these are the English and Spanish descriptors of temporal pain found in the sensory dimension of the McGill Pain Questionnaire. And this column represents the intensity rating based on a scale from 0 to 6, with 6 representing the greatest intensity. A new pain score is generated by classifying each descriptor as low or high intensity. In this example, we will classify all descriptors within the intensity range of 0 to 3 as low. And all of the pain descriptors within the range of 4 to 6 as high. Substantive considerations related to differences in pain determine the actual cut point for the intensity ratings. A series of 2x2 two two tables are then generated for each item by dividing the respondents first by overall scores of pain, low, moderate, and high, and then by two criterion groups, Spanish speakers and English speakers. An additional subdivision within each of the overall pain categories is based on the newly coded high and low intensity for individual responses by item. The numbers in each cell represent the number of individuals in each matched group whose pain response to this individual item was categorized as high or low. Inspecting the data, it appears that more Spanish speakers gave a high pain response to this item on temporal pain than did the English speakers. Are the differences great enough to indicate a systematic bias in the responses of Spanish speakers? The answer is derived from the application of the mantel hansel chi-square statistic. The p-value is the key to determining if an item is showing biased responses. Because we are dealing with multiple tests, the conventional p-value of 0 .05 is adjusted by dividing this value by the number of tests actually performed. In this case, the p-value would be divided by 20 which represents the number of categories of McGill pain descriptors. And 0 .0025 would be the adjusted p-value. In this illustration, given the adjusted value of 0 .0025, we can see that only the spatial pain category shows a systematic difference in the response of Spanish and English speakers. What do you do with problem items such as this? Essentially, you have two choices. You can review and revise the item going through the entire semantic equivalency process. Then you would need to retest the revised version. Or you can delete the item from both the Spanish and English versions. And then assess the impact of this deletion on internal consistency. 
Cronbox Alpha for the revised version needs to be greater than or equal to 0 0.60 to support using the revised instrument. What a first day. You learned a lot, old man. How naive you were to think you could continue your research without giving any thought to the culture or language of this patient population. You need help getting started. Conducting valid research in a cross-cultural environment requires a sensitivity to translation issues that address equivalency of meaning. Developing a cross-cultural adaptation of research instruments, such as the McGill Pain Questionnaire, requires an understanding of the culture and language of the target population, procedures for developing an equivalent Spanish and English form, and statistical methods to test for equivalency across both forms. These are major steps toward establishing a true cross-cultural adaptation, but only the first hurdle in getting started. To completely establish cross-cultural equivalence requires examining three other equivalency issues, technical, criterion, and conceptual. Technical equivalency would determine if responses vary across administration formats. For example, you would compare the responses obtained from the McGill questionnaire using a paper and pencil format versus responses obtained using a personal interview. Criterion equivalency would test the sensitivity of changes in test scores on the McGill questionnaire against clinically significant pain reduction brought about by some intervention. And conceptual equivalency would corroborate whether the same items grouped together for the Spanish and English speakers when factor analysis is applied to the scores. Each one of these three types of equivalency requires separate research measures, procedures, and statistical tools. If your resources limit you to only testing for meaning equivalency, you can build greater confidence in your results by checking the consistency of the scores you obtain against clinical judgment. Good luck getting started in a cross-cultural environment.